Hello, I'm Christy Fisher, president of Kirkwood Community College. We're proud to once again partner with the Iowa Ideas Conference. I hope you walk away with several new ideas and valuable partnerships. The same kind of partnerships Kirkwood has with regional employers, industry leaders, and communities, where we help build a workforce pipeline that strengthens our economy and prepares Iowans for the future. Enjoy the conference. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you, everyone, uh, and welcome to day two of Iowa Ideas. We hope everybody had a great first day of idea sharing and collaboration. Uh, I want to say a thank you to our presenting sponsor, ITC Midwest, our track sponsors, UFG Insurance, Mid-American Energy, Tanager, Inclusive ICR, and of course, the keynote sponsor who you just heard from, Kirkwood Community College. Uh, today, uh, we are open, uh, pleased to open the day with keynote Christina Moffat. Uh, when Des Moines native Christina Moffat appeared in the Food Network's Cupcake Wars, the experience opened her up, opened to an entrepreneurial passion that took her business to a national level. Before selling the business in 2022, Christina and her team worked tirelessly on catering bookings for a variety of celebrities and politicians. She currently is working on customer growth strategies with a special focus on small to mid-sized businesses. Please welcome Christina Moffat. Thanks for having me today, Zach. So a little bit about myself, um, as you kind of heard in my bio, uh, hometown gal, grew up in the Des Moines area, so excited to do anything that uh, shares back to Iowa when I was asked to do this. It's just a phenomenal experience. But like many of your listeners uh, kind of listening and watching today, I actually uh, had this gut feeling that I was supposed to do something else with my life. I kept coming up. I kept pushing the feeling down like most of us do. And the harder I pushed that feeling down, the more it kept leaning into me that I was going to have a really, really wild ride in entrepreneurship um, that would take me to a national stage with all uh, eyes on me to represent Iowa and entrepreneurship, but especially women in entrepreneurship. So um, was a project manager led into running a bakery and a cocktail lounge um, right out of the first recession, I have to say now, Zach, because now we've had, you know, dips and other ones, but Back in 2011, um, what started as a moment of bringing joy to people's lives in a very hard time um, during job cuts and things like that led on to a, a wild ride of owning a bakery cocktail lounge up to Cupcake Wars. And I know we'll get into some of the uh, background of what I did during that time and why things were a little rocky like any other entrepreneur. But 12 years of that, sold that, and now my passion is uh, helping really scale and grow uh, entrepreneurs on a national level, which I get to wake up every day and make an impact to our economy. It's pretty awesome. Well, that, that's fantastic. It, I, I'm curious a little bit about, you know, the, the experience of how, um, you know, most times entrepreneurs are, lo you know, very focused, uh, just local uh, and, and everything is, is growing the business. What was it like to then also, you know, be getting that national exposure? Uh, how do you balance both of those worlds. Um, and, yeah. and was it a distraction at times? <clears throat> yeah. So the time uh, that I got asked to go on the show, not a lot of people knew that I had major <clears throat> tragedy in the background. So when I was asked to actually appear on the show, my mother had just uh, actually suffered a massive stroke and she actually worked in the business with me. And so here I am at the hospital and get a call to go on this national television show, knowing that nobody from Iowa had really been asked to go on this show and the pressures of trying to leave my mom, not knowing if she would know who I was when I came back. Cause she was very hit or miss with her memory um, onto representing Iowa on a national level was everything was scary. There was nothing that wasn't scary at that time in my life. And um, the pressures of being one of the first on the show and having to compete and I don't come from a background, Zach, where there is movie sets and cameras in your face and people yelling at you that you have two minutes to finish a huge project. Um, but really, it was my younger sister looked at me and said, hey, this is your chance to represent women entrepreneurship in Iowa. And she said, I know you're scared, but I need you to get on that plane. <clears throat> I need you to get on that plane and I need you to go. And the show recorded in 2012, but we didn't air until 2013. So to also sit on a secret for so long for my friends and family, um, in addition to everything else I was facing, was incredibly hard. 
But it was a moment where I'm so proud because if you look at Iowa now and how many people we've been on, been able to have on uh, food cooking shows, um, it's amazing. I feel like I had a, a teeny tiny part, Zach, in opening those doors and really putting Iowa on the uh, map for food. What was the decision like to go from a, a you know project manager to entrepreneur? Uh, take take me through. I mean, you talked about that feeling creeping back in. Um, you know. What were you thinking? How were you weighing that? What factors were you weighing? And what was the feedback that you were getting from from others? Yeah, for sure. So uh, I was in a director position with an architecture firm. And when you think about back to the financial crisis in 2008, it took a while to catch up with all industries, but it really eventually did, right? So <clears throat> what ended up happening is I was going home and I just kind of feeling very worn down, not knowing when it was going to hit um, our firm. And I loved the people that I worked with. They become your family. Right. And so I really just wanted to kind of soothe my soul, which comes back to food. Um, I had, I was one of those weirdos that I loved waiting tables. Um, I loved it. I loved the connection of people and food, right? I could probably ask you the question of what's something you have at a holiday. That's a family tradition. That's going to come up. That is probably food. And so I started baking and taking it into work and people, started enjoying it. I gave them something to look forward to. Right. And so what ended up happening is that I actually got asked to do a market. Um, and so I decided, okay, I'll, I'll test this market. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't really have a logo. I didn't have boxes. So people would walk up and want to buy these cupcakes and I didn't have boxes to put them in. Cause I just thought they'd buy one at a time. But what happened is I committed to four weeks of doing this market and I took um, four dozen the first week because I only had to be there four hours. I thought nobody knows who I am. If I sell a dozen an hour, that's pretty good. Well, I sold everything in 90 minutes. <laughs> and this is back in 2000, again, 2011, when the cupcakes were kind of starting to trend, right? So the next week I took eight dozen and sold them all out. And all those people that I made promises to bring more showed up and came back. Uh, one of those promises fulfilled. And then I took 16 dozen and then I took 32 dozen. And if you can move 32 dozen cupcakes in four hours, you kind of have something. So what actually ended up uh, spurring the decision to go full time and leave my director job is that after that market hit, I was still working full time. So right, I'm working full time, selling on the weekends, cranking out on the Sunday morning, um, and kept trying to fight the feeling that I was supposed to do this because again, I'm going to leave a really steady paycheck for cupcakes. Like everyone was like, you're crazy. You're crazy. Right. But I booked an event in Des Moines for a thousand cupcakes. So it's like, if you can move 32 dozen, you know, at a market, which you think retail, and you can start booking events for a thousand, you might have something, right? And when people start lining up in your car because they know where you park, Zach, that's pretty scary. You really have something they like. <laughs> <laughs> I felt like I was being stalked. So the signs that really pushed me is I'm very close to my mom again. Uh, I called her one day and I just said, I can't do this. I've got to make this cupcake thing stop. And she's like, I don't think it's going to stop. She's like, you have every sign in the world that's pointing you of what you're supposed to do and what your actual talent is to give back to this world. And she's like, just watch for the signs. And I kid you not, I literally stopped at Des Moines and I, people who are on from Des Moines will know this across from a high school on second Avenue, there was a Dino storage. And that day that sign said, be patient and persistent. And it has just stuck with me. And from the time I saw that sign, just more things kept happening to show me the way. Now, when you got started, what was that transition like to, to deliver that scale? I mean, so, yeah. you know, making a few dozen cupcakes, you can do that in your kitchen at home. At what point, you know, were you having to figure out, okay, how do I actually deliver, you know, yeah. a thousand cupcakes? Were you, did you do that at home? Oh my gosh. So once I booked that thousand order, uh, my husband looked at me and was like, that, okay, that's great. That's great. That's really cute. But um, you need to sit down and how you're, figure out how you're going to do that. And it was going to take me like 26 hours of just putting pans in and out of the oven because you don't bake on the top rack or the bottom, only the middle. And I had this tiny little four quart mixer. And it was just like the motor is going to blow up on this thing if we try to produce that many. So I actually started putting the word out on the street to find a catering kitchen. 
And I was just, honestly, I was still scared to quit my job. I wasn't going to quit it yet. I was just going to get through this event and maybe things would work out. That was my, that was my motto. Um, but I ended up finding a catering kitchen that had all the equipment. Again, another sign that was really pointing me on like, this is meant to be. And I had a lot of voluntold friends and family that were like, we got to produce these. And I figured out how we were going to do it. And they all showed up and rallied because it was real. I mean, we had our own cupcake war before we actually appeared on the show. So <laughs> we um, <clears throat> cranked those cupcakes out. And then the reality hit that when we served a thousand people in Des Moines and they loved it, that we needed to actually hire. And so I quit my full-time job, decided to go at this. Um, and the first person I hired full-time was my mom. She actually came to me and said, I want to leave my job of 23 years and build the business with you. So uh, there was just really, we kept producing more. I wish I could tell you I had a really good system and I just knew exactly what I was doing. <laughs> but that's not true. We just kind of rolled and and, and grew as we scaled. <laughs> You know, and and we'll revisit the the cupcakes in a couple minutes. And I apologize for the train horn that is behind me. Um, we Can't are, hear it. You're oh, good. Well, good. Oh, um, yeah. The computer's telling me or asking me if I'm playing music. Um, <laughs> but um, you, know, I, I'm curious that is this different than a lot of the stories that you hear now, uh, where you know there's passion. It starts with passion. It starts with an idea. People testing. Uh, how how common is that story? Um, you know, for that, that entrepreneurial spirit to kind of catch on, Hey, I didn't feel fulfilled and I'm testing out this, this other thing. Uh, and mm -hmm. I don't know if it's going to become something. How often are you, you finding people that, that you're coaching that have similar pathways? Yeah, for sure. I, I do feel like people trip upon it. Um, there's some people definitely that set out to be entrepreneurs from the very beginning. Um, but other people usually find they they're solving a problem, right? Um, my problem when I look back is that people around me weren't happy. They didn't have something to look forward to or that piece of joy in their life. And that's what I problem solved. It came through cupcakes. That was my product. But you also have to <clears throat> begin to build a business. If you're only in love with your product and your business, you probably will never be successful. You have to build it. And the passion, oh, the passion for me was the people. And that's what kept me going every day. So don't fall in love with your product, fall in love with your, your why. And we hear that all the time, but usually it is something that sparked them. Um, but it gives them a reason to get up every day. And that's how most businesses start. They problem solve or had this unique idea. And then they've got to build a business around the idea to execute it. I'm curious the the cupcake wars. So you talk about kind of growing the scale. How did the you know, that opportunity come to light? Was that something, you know, that, that you had sought out at some point? How did they, how were those stars starting to, to come into to alignment? Yeah. So this is wild. We actually were, were pinged. Uh, we got an email and of course you think it's a little like somebody spamming me. Right. And they just said, Hey, we're trying to get basically all 50 States on the show. Uh, and they were basically emailing places where there was gaps and <clears throat> we had to put together a video, which we did. And we had put together a video a like a while ago. And they pinged me and just said, hey, we'd like to have you on the show. And the problem was is that I was still too small because you have to like pack up and leave. And at that point, we were only a handful of employees. And I'm like, well, I can't pack up and leave and everybody not know where I'm at, right? I mean, this just didn't make any sense. And so sure enough, when we moved to our to our brick and mortar location, because we had had a couple uh, catering kitchens, so we kind of stair-stepped our growth to minimize risk. So by the time we got to our bigger um, storefront, I got pinged again and it, they had been following us and just said, hey, we realize that you're in a brick and mortar now. And is there any chance that you would go and be able to go? And then I had to tell them the story of like, I don't, I don't think I can go. I don't, I don't know that I actually like cupcakes because my mom just had this stroke. We'd work together and they were very supportive. You know, of course they were kind of caught off guard and just said, you know, take that, take some time, um, which again, you don't have much time because you got to turn around and literally get on a plane. There's not like you could think about this. And um, yeah, so they had kind of followed us and I, my sister made the little nudge and off I went, <laughs> off I went. <laughs> 
what was the, I mean, obviously you're going through personal tragedy at, at that point, mm -hmm. but, but you're also, you have a young business. Uh, yeah. What was it like? I mean, how do you hand over the reins when you're, I mean, you're still essentially in building mode. Yeah. How, what, where were you even learning uh, the lessons of uh, what to do? Yeah. So, um, when we opened the brick and mortar location, it was, uh, in August of 2012 and everything was, it was so exciting, but like the air conditioner is not working. We have a POS system. Nobody knows how to use. I've never had 22 employees, nor have I run a bar. So it was kind of mass chaos in there. Um, uh, everyone was so excited. That's the best thing. Everyone was so gracious with us. But three weeks into opening my business, Zach, um, I was like just sick to my stomach going in there every day. And there's probably some people on the call that can maybe understand why, because when you sign a small business loan, you have to have collateral and I had collateralized my house. So this had to work, right? This had to work. And so, I mean, every day I just felt like I didn't know what I was doing. I was just nauseous and totally sick, stressed out going in there, working 16 hours a day. And you're starting to question like, why did I do this? But the reason I was actually sick is that I was 11 weeks and five days pregnant and did not know it. <laughs> so layer that in the story. Um, and when that happened, this is prior to my mom's stroke. Uh, my mom looked at me and she's like, now you got to figure out a management plan. You can't micromanage people. You can't be here all the time. Like this is a miracle baby that was given to you. Cause I was told I'd never have kids. Um, and so we put a management plan in place. It was really my mom that kind of set us up for success. So we then put a management um, system where we had a general manager. <clears throat> we had a morning bakery manager, a night cocktail lounge, a wholesale person, and an events person. And really, it was the small business development center that helped me sit and think about that. So I'm going to do a little bit of a pitch for them because it's a free resource. Um, and I know there's one at Kirkwood College. So thank you, Kirkwood, um, for sponsoring Um and they really helped me think through it. Like you have to delegate. Um, if you don't, you're probably inhibiting your business to grow. And thank goodness they did. So the reason I was able to go is that we had that management plan in place. And when my mom's stroke happened, I was able to completely step out and take care of her um, and then say yes to the show to go because we had a plan in place. You know, that, that certainly you weren't making that plan with a, a lot of time or a lot of uh, yeah. you know, okay, we can grow into this. Uh, what was it like? I mean, th that resource had to be really crucial in terms of asking the questions or, you know, boosting the confidence. Um, and, and a question that, that has come, um, what were some of your pain points and what were some of the resources that helped along the way? I, th yeah. I think folks are wanting to understand the, uh, you know, the, the, the resources that can be really particularly helpful. Sure. I think one of the worst pain points is you trying to do something that's your weakness. <laughs> you are your worst pain point. Um, if you keep trying to do things that you're not good at um, and don't ask for help, that's the worst thing you can do. So when I looked at my management team, we really looked at who has strengths where I don't so that we all click together. And so I was able to sit and talk with my um, small business counselor and just say, help me think through this. Like, I know that I'm not the best at all of these things, but how do I even begin to understand who's going to help me run this? And what we did is we really relied on that team. We built them as like, don't be the expert at everything, know where to go find the answer. Um, and every point of our, our business was different. So um, I love talking about the SBDC, the Small Business Development Center, because they're free. So please use them. They're an amazing resource. Um, I was fortunate enough for my banker to tell me that they were a free resource. I had not really heard of them. Um, and again, when you're getting started, everyone wants to sell you everything. And I just didn't have the funds to do that. So they were an amazing resource. The second thing that was amazing to me is I just started to find it okay to say, Hey, do you know someone who can help me with X, Y, Z? So I got really good mentors by just saying, I need help understanding my numbers better every month. And Somebody raised their hand and said, hey, I'm an internal accountant for a company. Let me sit and help you figure that out. And then I had an event planner that I called and said, hey, I just need you to walk me through what would be an expectation from you as somebody who would de deliver a large order and need to set up for an event. What door do I go in through? Do I have to use a certain elevator? Are there carts available to move thousands of cupcakes, right? 
And she's still, I just saw her last week. She's still amazing mentor of mine because I can call her with any question about how she built her business too. Um, I had an amazing mentor that helped me through the bar piece of the business. How do I hire mixologists? How do I trust people with alcohol that they're not going to abuse it? Um, and he's amazing. He's still with me today. So really those mentors, they're, they're not experts in just running a business, right? They are experts in different parts of my business. And I really just raised my hand and said, I need help. <laughs> I'm curious too, uh, you know, you hear about talent um, and it's extremely difficult to, to hire you know, the, the right people. How were you able to put together a team that, you know, was it birds of a feather flock together or <laughs> I mean, where were you finding folks to, to put this together um, yeah. so that it, it, it worked? You know, that is the hardest thing is hiring people because people can look really great on paper and then not execute, right? I mean, every, anybody can write a great resume. What actually mattered to me is their desire to grow and their personality. So can they click in a team? I don't need the top pastry chef to come in here and make the most beautiful pastries and not get along with anyone. That's the worst thing I could do, right? It, I needed people that just had the personality and wanted to make this work. And so that's how I interviewed people. We could teach them any skill, um, but I needed them to have the personality of wanting to work with a team and to see this team as their family. And so that's what we did. I mean, initially out of the gate, I made some not so great hires, right? Because you just, you don't know what you don't know. But eventually once I fell into the groove, Zach, of hiring people that fit the team and the team actually was able to weigh in um, on the hires, it was pretty incredible. So uh, a lot of my team, or if you've worked, uh, for us, will know that when you came in for an interview, I walked you through, did you engage with the staff? Did you ask me questions? Um, were you curious about where we're going or growing? Um, but really the staff would kind of watch them come through with me. And sometimes I would cautiously say, oh, I have to step out and take a call or, oh, sorry, I need to step away for a minute. And it was to leave that person with the team to see if they'd inter interact. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, were, were these folks, I mean, were you recruiting some of them or I mean, were they, they finding you um, just in the, in the candidate pool? Yeah. So uh, both, both at times, you know, I mean, I think you do have to go through both, both word of mouth is, is the best. Um, especially when uh, you know, someone that says, Hey, so-and-so might be looking to make a move. Are you, are you hiring? Uh, the other thing about my team is that we began to have people want to come to us because the management team was profit shared in. Um, and we were really, really receptive of ideas. So uh, one, I, I think, you know, if you can, no matter what your role is, if you can have an idea for the company and feel like you can say that idea, uh, whether it gets implemented or not, uh, is a really good place to work. One of the best ideas that we had that came was, uh, we had a dishwasher and um, loved him. He was so full of ideas. And he really just, he loved his role in the kitchen. He really, um, sometimes he would step over and help prep, but he would just say, you know, he took pride in what he was doing. But one of the best ideas he had is he said, he was an artist. And he said, hey, we have all this space and kind of these, you know, beautiful photography images of our product. But what if we actually put like local artists on the wall and did a reception for them that can't, can't get into galleries yet. And we did, it brought totally new crowd in, and we were able to celebrate another small business and um, other artists and help them out. Right. Um, one of my mentors said, don't ever nail anything to the ground Zach, because your team is going to figure out how to, how and where it should go. And I gave them free reign to do that. If this is not functioning the way you need it to, please make it work. And so they, could make it their own. Um, but they also knew that they, they didn't have to compete with each other, um, that every role that they were playing mattered in that company. And again, I just truly value them still to this day. I, I, I miss them dearly. That's the biggest part of my business. I miss. I'm curious kind of, so you, you had this, you know, takeoff period and it was, you know, uh, non-traditional, um, to, to some degree and, and extremely stressful, when did things start to level out? Uh, did you ever feel that, uh, that they started to kind of, okay, I, I feel good about this. Now we're going to, you know, flip over and enact a few more pieces of the growth plan here. Uh, how did, you know, how did that phase of, of growth and, you know, as people are starting to get to know, or they've, they've seen Cupcake Wars, you know, 
what what was that window of time um you know was it was it you know smoother yeah so we um again we had the two catering kitchens before we actually did the brick and mortar and i feel like what we really committed right when we did that brick and mortar location which um, that location opened in uh, August of 2012. And so that's when I found out I was pregnant and my mom had a stroke and the show called. And so I felt like we were really, really, really chaotic for that entire first year in that brick and mortar. So I didn't feel like we really smoothed out until we hit August of 2013. And I remember it being our one year anniversary and just standing there sobbing that we had made it because there were so many things that should have just taken us out in that first year. Um, but the team, the team is why we made it right. So we just talked about the team. If I would not have had that team in place, we wouldn't have made it. So from 2013 to, uh, about December of 2019, (laughs) everything was great. (laughs) We just kept clicking. Uh, the team introduced new products. That is, that is a lot of them. The cocktails, we uh, appeared, um, in national magazines for what we were doing for being kind of this new concept of a dessert lounge out of Des Moines, Iowa. Everybody was enamored with that. Like Des Moines, Iowa has this, um, and it was great. It was great. We really did click along. And I think it's because I let go of the reins, had a great team around me and welcomed all this new ideas that we talked about. The idea to, to do a dessert lounge, I mean, that's not, you know, the traditional bakery. When you think of, you know, Cupcake Wars, it's, you know, as much as you can do around cupcakes. How did that idea come to be? Um, and, you know, how did you convince others to, to back that? Um, and how did you decide where the right place? How did you make those decisions uh, so that the scale would be right? Yeah. So actually it was a, it was a vision from the beginning, which a lot of people don't, don't realize that that was part of my long, my long-term vision. But from the very beginning, I wanted to have this dessert lounge concept. And the reason was, is that when I traveled with friends, family, whoever it was, uh, we like to try as many food places as we can. So we'd go one place for an appetizer, maybe a meal at another place, but it was so hard to find a place that you could just have dessert that wasn't a coffee shop or an ice cream shop at the end of the night. Because if you went into a restaurant, they didn't want to seat you at a table just to serve you dessert, right? They're trying to wind down. Um, and it wasn't, it just wasn't a great experience. And I don't blame them, right? I mean, they're there to have a higher head, uh, price per head. And so I just, every time we traveled, I kept thinking, man, if every city had this little like unique cocktail lounge where you could just order dessert and a cocktail, how amazing would that be? And we could never find it, no matter how much we traveled. And so it became a mission (laughs) to make it happen. And we were going to make it happen in Des Moines. And so that is where it came from. But also I knew from a business standpoint that it would make us completely unique to the market. Um, the thing that was really hard is that I knew my numbers. I, I I had to bootstrap it from the beginning and I knew that it would work. But being a new concept is very scary out of the gate because nobody wanted to, to lend to us. They did not understand why we would put a cocktail lounge in a bakery. Nobody wanted to, to take the risk on this new concept. And we were actually denied seven times for a loan. Seven different banks told us no. Part of that is because financial crisis, right? Now here we are asking for money on the back end, but a lot of them just felt it was too risky that Des Moines just wasn't ready for something like that. And here we are, <laughs> here we are, it's still there. So what gave you the motivation to keep going though? I mean, sometimes by, th- you know, three or four, maybe you'd be like, okay, um, yeah. what, how, how are you still optimistic, you know, at, after that sixth denial to go the seventh right. time. I was not, <laughs> to be honest with you. Uh, it was more my friends and family being like, everything's showing you that this is supposed to happen. And this is part of the journey. Um, you're kind of in a valley right now because the highs are high and the lows are lows. And that was definitely a really low point. But everything kept showing that this was going to work, right? I mean, and even on national scale, the cupcake craze was going crazy. So we knew that that piece, even if the cocktail lounge didn't work, we knew we could just run off the cupcake piece. Um, the seventh ask actually came to me. The seventh, or the the final one, I should say the eighth one came to me. They actually came to me and said, um, 
this is the point that I say, be nice to everyone around you because somebody has the money. <laughs> it was a guy I went to grade school with, called me and said, hey, super random. We know we haven't talked for a long time, but it has been said that you're trying to do this cocktail lounge and a bakery. <clears throat> and he's like, he's in a very small town. And he's like, we really are needing to do some more SBA loans. And he's like, I was telling the president of the bank about your concept. And he went to a chocolate store um, that actually had a cocktail lounge in it. And so he understands what you're trying to do and would really like to talk to you. And so I drove up to Slater, Iowa, to this tiny little bank, getting ready to be rejected by somebody now I knew. <laughs> and sure enough, they said, I think it's a great idea. And let's see if we can get it done. And so other, otherwise, I think I would have given up, honestly, Zach, because it just felt like the world was against me at that point. That That's just, it's fantastic. And it, it's interesting that, you know, a relationship that started in grade school, you know, just a classmate mm -hmm. would be, you know, <laughs> the one that yeah. kind of connects uh, that, that far down the line. I'm curious, you've shared a lot of uh, moments with family uh, throughout this process, but, you know, there's also that challenge of, you know, when you work with family, um, <laughs> that, you know, suddenly all of the lines are blurred. How are you able to to kind of work as work and family as family? Um, how are you able to, to manage that? And what advice do you have uh, for folks that maybe are, you know, relying on their family uh, to get something going? Yeah, for sure. Um, I was very fortunate. My mom and I have a really, really great relationship. Um, she's still my rock to this day. I should say, even after her stroke, she never came back to work, but she, um, went through recovery and everything. And she just is the most supportive person I know. Um, so luckily we didn't have a lot of strain to work with my mom, but she really said, Hey, you are the CEO and the president of this company and you need to run it like you are. So if I'm going to be your manager, then you're going to tell me my, what my role is and I'm never going to fix this for you. So it was very defined from the beginning that she was in production. I was running the company and that she was, she was handing that over for me to run it the way that I wanted to run it. Um, the other thing is that we really tried not to talk about work outside of work. You know, it's almost like a persona you put on. Like when I had tied my hair back and put my hat on to go to work, um, we were going to work together. And uh, I will not say that my mom did not see me cry often or have meltdowns in the kitchen. That's why I think goodness she was my first hire because she wasn't going to turn me into the HR department. Um, and there was not an HR department, uh, but she was amazing. And so I think you would just have to define the roles, just like you have a job description, any other job, don't, don't let those lines get blurred, but you also should not work with family. If you know that you're not going to be able to sit at a holiday and look at them across the table, it's just not worth it. How were you able <laughs> though? I mean, the idea of separating uh, work, you know, not talking about work at home. I mean, when you're getting going, that is your world. Um, and, and so uh, how are you finding you know, that, that ability to step away and how important is, you know, in hindsight now, how important is that ability to step away, um, uh, to, to the process? Yeah. Um, I did not do it right in the beginning. <laughs> Again, like being the manager and wearing all the hats and like managing my team. Um, I just felt like I could not go. I didn't have boundaries um, from the beginning, and that was really hard. Um, I Now when I coach and work with businesses, I actually make them time block. I actually make them put down, hey, this is going to be just for me time. This is going to be where I take my kids to school, and they have to protect that time from the beginning. Um, I said no to a lot of things with friends, which I had to um, when I was building the company, especially when my house was on the line, right? Like, hey, sorry, uh, so-and-so called out, and I got to go. But it did strain relationships. And in the end, it wasn't worth it to me, right? I had a really good team and I wanted to demonstrate to them that work is not their life either. And so when I started to walk the walk, talk the talk, right, of what we need, there is no balance, but what we needed to do to make sure everyone had time off, to make sure everyone could get to family graduations when May is the busiest month. Um, I really started to look at life differently. And I, I don't know that I would have changed had my mom had not had her stroke. 
So the silver lining in that horrible event is that you, I reprioritize and I reprioritize quickly. And we as a team would talk about who needed time off and what things were important that week um, so that we can make it happen. Now, not everything could happen, but we would do our best um, to make life life and work work and make them blend. So you eventually made the decision to, you know, uh, to sell the business. And, and I'm curious, take me through that process. What, what was involved in that decision? How did you recognize that that was the right time? Did, did you have the aspirations to go into the coaching at that point? Um, because a lot of people, uh, I don't know that they would recognize that, that uh, as it's happening. Yeah. So I sold the business two years ago. Um, I knew that I would always sell it. I was building it. I wanted to have somebody else have a chance to be an entrepreneur and even working with entrepreneurs today, you're, you have two choices. You're either going to leave your business and sell it by choice. Or you're going to get out because something happened. And so I knew that I wanted to always have the option to sell it. So we built it around policies, procedures, everything from the beginning um, to be able to sell it. Cause that's really what businesses are buying, right? They're buying that, um, name, that brand, but also the processes and procedures around the business. And what ended up, uh, being the decision is that, um, my, both my parents had pretty life-threatening issues at the same time, all within 30 days had very severe heart conditions. And as my mom was sick, so sick when my dad had open heart surgery, he had to have five bypasses um, that she couldn't even be at the hospital. So we had other people help taking care of her. And I just remember looking at him thinking time is running out. Like this isn't going to get better. It's not like, it's not like he's um, going to wake up and have 30 more years to go. Right. I mean, he's going to wake up and we're going to get through this, but time is still running out at the other end of my ticker for time with my parents. And so I called a mentor, one that had been with me from the beginning. And I just asked him, I said, how do you know when it's time? How do you know when it's time to let go? And he said, well, if you're asking the question, you probably know, but he said, listen to your gut and you'll know if it's time. And I remember my dad sleeping and leaning over the bed and just sobbing because I knew that it was time. I knew that it was time. And the biggest thing was I couldn't show up for my staff the way that I always had and the way that I wanted to. And I also didn't want the business to start to take a nosedive because of what was going on in my personal life and needing more time with my parents. And so I needed to find somebody that could step in and give the team the attention they needed. Again, they had been running the shop for a very long time by themselves because I actually started coaching and mentoring while I was still owning the shop. Um, it became an important part of my journey. But um, once I put the word out, uh, it was a friend that said, hey, I actually know somebody that would, that would be really interested in talking to you um, about buying the shop and let's just see where it goes. And that's how we transitioned. But I'm, I'm grateful that I sold it. Um, Sammy, the new owner's done amazing. Amazing. I'm so proud of her for taking it and making it her own. Um, it's, it's not what it was to me, but honestly, when you buy a business, you got to make it your own. And she's done an amazing job. Um, I'll, a lot of my staff have gone on to be entrepreneurs, which makes me even more proud um, because they, they were able to learn. And I've been supportive of that too. Um, and then, yeah, just being able to continue to give back and help people think through problems because they're never going to go away is kind of the coaching that I do now. You know, I, I maybe missed a, an opportunity to ask a question early on, but why cupcakes? You know, was it something that, you know, you were drawn to? Was that tapping into something you you loved? Uh, were you a, a, a kid baker? Or what, what was the um, why cupcakes? And was it ever about the cupcakes for you? Or was it about this other part of the journey? Yeah, so um, cupcakes is because I just am fascinated by the food industry. And, you know, I mean, Iowa kind of being in the middle, we start to get trends from both sides, both coasts. And so I knew that it was something that was trending. I knew that we really didn't have uh, a cupcake. We did have a cupcake shop, um, but there, there was, there was room to play in that, that space. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, there's other 
great bakeries too. And it was just something that I felt like, okay, this is something that's trending right now. So we started with the cupcakes just because I knew it was going to eventually hit Iowa. We did end, end up getting some chains here, but um, that's what it was for me. But honestly, it, the reason I stuck with dessert, which I think might be part of your question and not a full blown restaurant is that dessert shows up in everyone's memories, right? So every year you have a birthday cake when you're growing up, right? When you have a wedding, you have a cake, you have a cake cutting part of the wedding. Um, when you have now gender reveals, it's in cake. And to me, I wanted to be a lasting part of people's memories. Um, it was just something where people gather with loved ones uh, around them and it's usually dessert, right? It's the grand finale is dessert. And to me, um, I wanted to be able to celebrate life's moments, whether they were huge or small, right? When you're a kid and you do a good job and you get to go get a cake, a uh, cookie or a, a cupcake or, you know, some special treat because you're with your mom or your dad um, and you got an A on your paper, right? Those small moments up to somebody's wedding and gender reveal. I mean, they're huge. And that's why I stuck with dessert is that um, we would be part of people's memories for a very long time to come. Now, do you still make time to bake? Um, and what's, what's your favorite thing to bake? Yeah. So the funny thing is uh, over the 12 years that I owned the business, I really did not bake <laughs> being around it all day. I kind of uh, stopped doing it at home, but definitely have started baking a lot more uh, just over the last couple of years. Uh, my son is now 11 and very intrigued by food and ingredients too. Um, like I was with my mom, that's where the baking piece comes from. I just wanted to know why you put things together and then it comes out as this beautiful dessert. Um, one of my favorite things to make is around the holiday season, my mom has always made these coffee cakes um, for all friends, families, teachers growing up. And so that's actually one of my favorite things to do because it makes me think of doing it with her. And my sister and I actually still go to her house and help her produce usually about 50 coffee cakes for her church friends and her neighbors and everything. And that's just one of my favorite things to do with her. But I still like testing new recipes. I still like pushing the envelope. Um, I think failure is key when you have a bakery, not everything works. Um, but yeah, I like to, that's my creative outlet is to still do a little bit of that. Okay. Uh, one of the uh, questions from the audience is also what did, what other advice do you have for Iowans who want to start a business in, in something that they're passionate about? How would you encourage that initial, um, you know, what, what are the first few steps? Yeah, for sure. Um, my encouragement is do it. <laughs> um, do it. Um, think about the amazing things that you can contribute back to your community. Um, but do it cautiously. Like you can't just wing it and not have a plan. That's what I tried to do in the beginning. And it was really important to be, um, nobody runs to write a business plan. Trust me. Uh, nobody wants to stop and put rules around their game, but it's important that you do that. So you have the long-term success. Um, steps to do what I think is it's really scary for people to say it out loud. It was scary for me. I just said, kept saying, oh, my side hustle, you know, oh, bacon this weekend. I never called it what it was, you know, that, hey, I actually have a small business. Um, but seek guidance from the beginning because you won't know everything. Um, and it it's better to learn from others um, that have been through it than to do it on your own. So stair steps to get going. I mean, really write your ideas down, begin to talk to multiple people. The hard thing in Iowa and I love Iowans, but we're so Iowa nice. Uh, we need to build a business. We really need, do need constructive feedback. So make sure people know that, Hey, give me some things that would uh, maybe come up that I'm not thinking about, right? Like help me really think through this in a true way. Um, but say it out loud, talk to people. There's other legal things you need to do. Make, sh make sure you do it right from the beginning. Um, that's where the SPDZ can really come in and help you know what to do legally. There's things like tax identification numbers and um, different industries have different tax laws around it and make sure you seek that out as well. You, as you approach businesses, how do you develop that trust? Um, in some ways, you know, when you're starting a business, that is, you know, uh, you, you care deeply about it. And so sometimes it's hard to, to trust others to, to help you. How, you know, from both roles as an individual, how did you know to trust the mentors that you had? But then also, how do you work to build 
trust when you're a coach going in uh, to, to work with someone? Yeah. Um, I think the trust factor for me is like the word of mouth for the mentors is where they came. Right. So I, I had people who I knew uh, were very trustworthy people vouching for this person. Uh, could I have been a taken advantage of? Yeah. Um, that's why I don't think it's great to go on the internet, just researching people. Word of mouth is always best. Um, so it wasn't like I just pull, pull out trusted people right out of the way. You kind of dip your toe, right? Kind of give a little bit more information um, to people as you go. But we're very lucky now that I work coast to coast uh, in Iowa. We have one of the best, best ecosystems for entrepreneurs. Um, it's just amazing here. All the um, resources work together, right? I mean, the bankers know each other. The attorneys know each other. If, if they're not an expert in this, they'll refer you to the right person. And so I think you do have to get out of your own way. Sometimes it's very scary to let go of that trust, but also once you get burned, you figure out how to do it better. Right. I mean, I'm not going to tell you you won't get burned by employees or people maybe who you divulge too much information to, but go with word of mouth, ask people around uh, for mentors. And then for me building that trust, I've been there. I've been there. I've done this. Um, I've got the battle wounds to prove it. And so I'm not a fit for everyone, right? Um, I really focus on here's kind of helping them map out the plan and then they've got to do it. I'm not going to be there to to hold your hand. I'll be there when you need to have somebody that's like, oh, I'm stuck. Can you help me through, think through this? Yeah, I can do that. Um, so you kind of have to know your own limits too because I'm not really a hand-holding person. Like I just want you to tell me what I need to do and then get out of the way and I'll go do it. So finding somebody who fits your personality style as well, if you need somebody to sit with you longer, then make sure you you find a, a mentor or a coach um, that can do that with you. Or if you just need to black and white like me, uh, somebody to kind of keep pushing you, then there's people like that too. But make sure you, the biggest thing too is like interview people. People don't realize you can interview bankers. You can interview attorneys. You can interview your insurance agents. A lot of people just go with the first person. That's not always a good fit. So you, you're hiring people, like interview them back. Uh, there's a question uh, from the audience, uh, and, and it is along the lines of, in, in those difficult times, what, what kept you going? What do you draw on for that support? And, you know, how do you, uh, there are difficult days and then there are difficult periods of time. How, how did you get through those? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Again, I come back to like, know your why. So for me, my why was um, really making an impact in my community. And the way that I did that was through my employees and my business, right? So I knew also that I was impacting the people that we were serving's lives. And so that's what got me up every day. It wasn't the cupcake. It wasn't the business of itself. It was like, who's having a bad day that we're going to impact today, right? which one of my teammates is going to need to uh, say, Hey, my cup's only 30% today and I need somebody else to carry 70%. And that's what got me up. Um, the long periods, they feel like they're never going to end. That's the hard part. You start thinking like, Oh my gosh, did I pour everything in this business to then not make it? I mean, COVID was very dark. It was very dark, but I still got up every day and went looked at that staff because I knew that they needed us. I knew that they needed those jobs. Right. Um, and I knew that they just needed to see each other every day. We might not be moving a lot of product, but we're going to figure out how to make payroll and we're going to be there for each other. And so if you don't know your why of why you're doing your business, that's going to be really hard in those dark periods to get up every single day. And my why has always been around community. So, you know, the way that I served my community was through small business and building a great business that had great employees. That's where our name come from, comes from. So Krem uh, was the name of the business and Krem rises to the top, right? Top-notch service, top-notch staff, top-notch everything on top of those cupcakes. Um, and that, again, being that top-notch person is what got me out of bed every day. It wasn't really the product. It was the people. So... So, Christina, you you have a lot of pieces that have been very they're very tied together. Everything has been thought through. How did you tie all of those pieces together from the the name of the business to the vision uh, to who you're helping? How did was that natural or were were people helping you uh, you know tie all of these 
elements together. Yeah. So for prior to starting uh, CREM and working at the architecture firm, my background was in uh, marketing and management. So when you're building buildings, they have to tie together to function properly. And I think that working there is what made me look at, okay, this business is another project. It sounds crazy, but if you don't tie all the aspects together, it's not going to function properly, just like the building needs to function properly. Um, and so I, I what really was intentional in taking a step every day, but also I needed to figure out what pieces around this would serve my why. You know what? I mean, I we could have left out any little piece along the way, and I don't think it would have ended the way it did. But it came back to really building something great for our community. That was from the beginning. That was my vision. And you can't build something great for your community if you don't have great people alongside of you. And then you don't have great customers that support the idea. You have spent a lot of time giving back uh, over the span of the career, working on boards and, and things as well. Why is community so important to you? And how were you able to make that time uh, to do it? And what advice do you have to others uh, in, in doing that? Yeah. If you don't make time, it'll never happen. <laughs> um, but community was important to me. I mean, even if you look at some of my social media, you'll see that uh, my long-term goal is to wake up and make the place a little better than I found it. And that's just always been who I am. Uh, I think seeing my parents involved in their community and, and giving back where they could was instilled in me is that you can go through life and never impact another person's life. But will that be fulfilling? Will that be fulfilling when your time is done? And to me, I know that that answer is not. I know that I need to impact in in any way I can every day, uh, whether it's smiling at someone walking down the hallway, you know, because you don't know what they're going through. And I, you reflect a lot on your parents and how much they sacrifice for you, right? Or whoever raised you really in reality, how much they sacrifice for you. And when you look at the business, it really is like raising a child, right? You're going to sacrifice everything to make sure that that, that business makes it. Um, you know, when those days are dark, like we talked about, yeah, that's considered a skin knee. How are you going to help that business get up and keep moving forward? Um, the biggest thing I think, Zach, to your question is I just made time for it. I just made time for it. And I actually made time and took my son when I could. It was important for him to see that this world is beyond him but he needs to do everything he can to have an impact around him every day. Well said. Um, you um, you talked a little bit about how well things work together uh, in Iowa and how Iowa is lucky in the entrepreneurial landscape. Um, but but I'm curious, you know, are there pain points that you see? And if you had the magic policy wand, what would you do? Uh, what what are some things that maybe could make the the landscape even better? Yeah. Um... Well, wow, policy is a slippery slope. <laughs> so I'm uh, I'm gonna maybe say my wish list. How about that? That's perfect. Um, yeah, I I really wish that it was just easier, right? I mean, the hard thing is is that uh, and working with entrepreneurs again, coast to coast, there's no magic playbook of systems being the same. So when you start a business, you got to adhere to your city rules, you got to adhere, adhere to your county rules, you got to adhere to your state rules, you got to adhere to the federal rules. And, and, and entrepreneurs don't make mistakes intentionally, right? It's just, they don't know what they don't know. So if, if I could wave a magic wand, I would wish that there would be some type of playbook that may just made it easier from city to county to state to federal uh, for businesses to manage, right? Um, that's the biggest hoop. That's where businesses get slowed down is that they got entangled in something because they didn't know. They didn't know they had to f fill out this form. Or they didn't know they had to have a grease trap. Like that's one of the biggest things in the Des Moines area, but it's not applicable all over, right? Um, and really entrepreneurs are not trying to wake up and break the rules or laws or policies. <laughs> They're just trying to survive and thrive. So that would be my wish. We are, again, very fortunate in Iowa that if we don't know something, a lot of our systems talk to each other to help uh, small businesses uh, solve that problem and move on. Not every state's like that. And, you know, who, are there you know, ways that you'd like to see that? I mean, you can write a policy or a guidebook, but are, um, you know, are, are there other ways or other systems uh, that maybe could be enacted uh, to help? 
Yeah, I think if we just even had point people for each of that, right? I mean, I'm going to use Des Moines right now because that's that's where I live. They have two small business people that are appointed by the city now to help small businesses navigate and get started. That was awesome. It was awesome when uh, Connie, our mayor, put that in, in place. It was one of our first missions is make this easier for entrepreneurs. Um, so even if you just had a point person at each step of the way versus like getting entangled in permit uh, centers <laughs> and them not really knowing or understanding like every minute that business owner standing at your counter, they're losing money. But like, let's get this figured out. I mean, even if you didn't have a whole playbook, just have a point person or an advocate that can actually advocate for the entrepreneur with the city, with the county, with the state, you know, at the federal level. Uh, SBA nationwide does that really well. You can call an SBA office. They'll help you navigate a lot of the state and federal. Um, but it's as easy as that. Just have an advocate that's assigned to help these small business owners maneuver the systems. So uh, another uh, food is on the mind this morning of the audience. And so <laughs> yeah. uh, we have a question. How long did it take you to find the the signature recipe for cupcakes? And I guess I'll add part of my own. How did you test that and how did you refine? Yeah, thank goodness I had a mom that made everything from scratch. Uh, so it really did start with her and my knowledge of growing up with her. I, I lived in the kitchen with her. I'm one of five kids and I was the only one that was intrigued of what she was doing, why she was doing it. Where did that recipe come from? How do you just know, you know, a pinch of this? How much is that? Um, but to produce that on massive scales was different. You can't, a lot of times recipes don't translate. And Iowa has this wonderful thing called humidity that impacts baking. So if you're struggling baking in the summer, just it's all that lovely humidity that we get that can make things a little too moist that can fall in. Um, so actually I was very fortunate again, reaching back out to people I knew. I said, um, to my, one of my best friends actually lives in Las Vegas. She, uh, has a bunch of friends in the food industry. And I just said, Hey, do you have any contact that produces for a large resort that can help me review this recipe and get it so I can produce on mass scale? And that's what happened. I had uh, somebody take mine and be able to tweak it to produce on a mass scale. It's one of the last questions and uh, is what's next and how do you know um, uh, for you, but what advice do you have to, to others of, you know, how long do you let something bake in the background uh, before <laughs> you, you know, you, you take that plunge? Yeah. Uh, I love the pun there. So thanks for throwing that in. I always love baked puns. Um, I had to wait, you know, yeah. almost 58 minutes in. I love but. it. I love it, Zach. Um, don't, don't wait too long. There's never going to be a right time, right? Um, again, just start talking to people about your idea. Get some guidance again um, on your idea. If you really don't want to say it out loud, go to the SBDC. Everything's 100% confidential. Um, and they're in all 50 states. So I know we've got people watching throughout the U.S. Every single state has SBDC offices. So Iowa alone has 15. Talk, just talk to someone. Help them. Um think out loud about it, but, um, there's never going to be a right time. I mean, if I would have known I was pregnant, my mom was going to have a stroke. I never would have done it. And if I wouldn't have done it, it wouldn't have led me to where I'm at today. Everything you're doing is a stair step to the next thing you're supposed to be doing in your life. Um, I'm a big gut person. If it feels scary, um, there's two different types of nervousness in your tummy. One saying this is scary, but I know it's right. And one is literally those danger signals telling you don't do it. And if you stop when you get that feeling and you think about which one it is, you could usually clarify pretty quick in your head. But the longer you wait, somebody else is going to come up with your idea and execute it. And that third feel is probably telling you to eat a cupcake. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always pro sugar, Zach. Always pro sugar. <laughs> No. Well, I, I appreciate your time this morning. Thank you, Christina. It's been a, a fantastic um, conversation here this morning. Uh, appreciate you joining us uh, and best of luck uh, for what's next with you. Uh, a couple of reminders to our attendees. Uh, we have the morning blocks of conferences or morning blocks of sessions, and we'll return uh, for the closing keynote with Jen Loeb at one o'clock this afternoon. Have a great morning, everyone. Thanks. Thank you.